In a nutshell, Tesla is essentially a busted growth story. It's essentially, 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 we see Tesla as a busted growth story. It's essentially, 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 it's pretty simple. We see Tesla as a busted growth story. It's a busted growth story. That is effectively a busted growth story. It's a fact that it's a busted growth story. Essentially, 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 it was essentially, 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 and again, it's a busted growth story and they don't have any technological disadvantage. Hey guys, welcome to Connecting the Dots, the podcast where we follow the breadcrumbs and try to predict where disruptions will take us. If you haven't done that already, please subscribe to the channel and smash the like button to support it. It really helps the channel. With a laughingly low Tesla valuation, an outspoken manner, and nonstop media appearances, Gordon Johnson has become a cult figure among both Tesla Qs and Tesla fans. For Tesla Qs, and some in mainstream media, he's an intelligent analyst, an expert unafraid to speak out his opinion, even if controversial. But for Tesla fans like me, he's meme material. Some of us think that he's a moron, the class clown, and the dumbest analyst alive. Others think that he's an oil shill who doesn't believe what he says and just pushes his master's agenda. Say what you want about Gordon. The only thing nobody blames him of is being plain vanilla. Gordon is too high profile to pass under anyone's radar, and he certainly appeared in mine. I decided to check who he really is, essentially. In this video, I'll take you through Gordon's breadcrumbs. I'll start with my motivation for doing this, continue with Gordon's background, go on to show that Gordon is much smarter than we tend to think, and finally expose the reasons for Gojo's bearishness and what lessons we should learn from it all. Yep, I went after Gordon and cracked his code and found out the reasons for his ultra bearishness on Tesla. The reasons surprised me, and I think they'll surprise you too. Everything in this video is my opinion only, so read everything I say here with allegedly, and as Gordon would put it, essentially, do your own research, check the facts, and form your own opinions. I'm just rambling. Before we dive in, I'd like to thank eBike Adventures of St. Pete for sponsoring this video. Ebike Adventures of St. Pete are a family-owned business that provides fun, GPS-guided e-bike tours of one of the most e-bike-friendly cities around, beautiful St. Pete, Florida. There's a link in the description below, and if you tell them you saw them here, you'll get 20% off. From 2015 on, I gave a series of presentations about disruptions. My early presentations started by discussing exponential growth and showing that we are at the cusp of disruptive times. I then showed the following slide and discussed how steep exponentials can become. We need to understand that the world is changing and we must constantly keep updated and predict where it's heading to because when the exponential gets steep, we don't wanna fall off of it. And if we do, we need some kind of parachute to keep us safe. Forgive the ancient graphics, but the point is that we must understand disruptions. Sure, this video is about funny guy Gordon, which never fails to crack us up, but it also weaves a sad story of an intelligent guy Yes, intelligent, which failed to grasp disruption. So let's buckle up and get ready because disruptions are never boring. Let's listen to Gordon for a while. In 2020, Tesla lowered the prices of some of its cars. This is what Gordon had to say. The reality is in the month of July, they sold about 11.4 thousand cars in China. They produced uh -huh. about 12.2. So they uh -huh. actually built inventory and that's despite eight price cuts globally this year, four of which were in China. So they're cutting the price uh -huh. of the cars they have another facility in China, and yet they're selling less cars. Then in Q1 2021, Tesla kept prices largely the same and delayed expected price cuts. Now Gordon said this. What happened in the fourth quarter of last year is Tesla effectively had fully uh, uh, passed through the massive price cuts in China, and its Shanghai facility was fully ramped. When you also consider that they've effectively picked the low-hanging fruit of entering the world's largest three out of markets, U.S., China, Europe, and their sales grew just 2% quarter over quarter, despite 15 price cuts in the first quarter of this year, 18 price cuts over last year, and 52,500 more cars of capacity sold. They didn't have any chip problem. They produced more cars in this quarter than they did last quarter, and they grew just 2% and still has a big problem. So by Gordon, if Tesla lowers its prices, then it's a bad sign for Tesla because it means there's no demand. But if Tesla doesn't lower them, then it's bad too because it means that they can't lower costs to get to wider markets and growth will be linear. This kind of mental gymnastics made me recently tweet this. On the walls of Cologne City Hall, hidden under a larger statue of Archbishop Conrad von Hochstetten, 
is a grotesque carving from 1410 of a man giving oral sex to himself. I'm often reminded of it when I hear the contortions Gordon Johnson has to make to justify his outlook for Tesla. This might be a bit mean, but it's true. Gordon goes to extreme lengths to find bad things to say about Tesla, even in record-breaking quarters. There are a million examples of how Gordon cherry-picks data. When Tesla sales are low in Norway, he says that Tesla is losing market share there. And since Norway is ahead in EV adoption, it means Tesla will lose everywhere. But if a month later, ships full of Teslas finally arrive at Norway, and Tesla outsells everyone, suddenly Norway isn't mentioned at all, and Tesla is doomed for some other reasons, such as essentially ZEV credits will soon run out. He jumps from one topic to another, overloads listeners' ears with disconnected data, and then bluntly gives his verdict that Tesla is a busted growth story. It is way overvalued, and once the market sees this, the stock will go down like a lead balloon. Every time I see him, I can't help but wonder, does he really believe this, or are there ulterior motives? Is he too dumb to see the truth, or is he just lying through his teeth to please a big oil puppet master? This really intrigued me, so I started a quest. To get my data sorted out, I first checked Gojo's history. What I found surprised me. Gordon's performance is so appalling that he is currently ranked 7,177th out of 7,490 analysts on tip ranks. To get a feel of what this means, try guessing which analyst is number one on tip ranks. Did you guess Pierre Faragou of New Street Research? No, Pierre's at number 2,303, with a 63% success rate and an average return of over 7%. How about Joseph Osha from JMP Securities? No, Joseph's a very respectable 322nd with a 63% success rate and an average return of over 31%. Let's check Dan Ives of Wedbush. He ranks a whopping number 92, with a 66% success rate and an average return of over 31%. And first place goes to Gerard Cassidy of RBC Capital, with a whopping 84% success rate and over 34% average return per rating. Compared to these, Gordon shows a 54% success rate and an average return of negative 6%. Considering the bull market we had during this time, flipping a coin should have been much better than trusting Gordon. Funny thing is... Had I asked you this question in 2013, the guy in the first place would have been Gordon. Yes, that's right. Gordon Genius Johnson, the class clown, was number one of all tip break analysts with an amazing 83% success rate and an average return of almost 20% above the S&P 500. You might think now, maybe he got lucky with a few stocks. Maybe. We'll get to that later. But first, let's check his history. We'll start by checking his old hidden LinkedIn page. Gordon studied in Morehouse College. I'm no expert in American colleges and didn't check deeply, but a brief check showed that while it's not one of the best colleges in the USA overall, it is one of the most sought-after colleges for African-American undergraduate students. Gordon completed a Bachelor of Arts degree in Finance and Economics. He graduated in 2002, summa cum laude, and is a Phi Beta Kappa Morehouse alumni. Upon graduating, he got a job at J.P. Morgan Chase. He graduated in the top 10% of J.P. Morgan's investment banking analyst class and started work as an investment banking analyst. After a year and a half, Gordon joined Credit Suisse as an equity research associate. And after two years, he joined Bear Stearns as a senior equity research associate. In this position, one of his reports won the Proprietary Research Award as voted by Bear Stearns traders. After a year at Bear Stearns, Gordon joined Lehman Brothers as vice president equity analyst at the Semiconductor's memory and solar power team. He stayed there for two years until they went belly up. To the best of my knowledge, Gordon was not the reason behind Lehman Brothers' collapse. Essentially, After leaving Lehman Brothers in 2008, Gordon joined Hapo Aleem Securities, and in 2010, he joined Axiom as general manager. This part is a bit fuzzy, because upon leaving Hapo Aleem Securities, Gordon opened a fresh LinkedIn account in which the two years between Lehman and Axiom were left blank. I have no idea why he did this, but maybe he wanted to disassociate himself from Hapo Aleem Securities, since their owner, Hapo Aleem Bank was under investigation for money laundering fraud. If I were Gordon, I would stop everything here and say that I'm not accusing anyone, but isn't it weird that two years after Gordon worked at Bear Stearns, they collapsed, and two years after he joined Lehman Brothers, they went belly up? And why doesn't anyone ask how it is that Hapo Aleem Bank was fined for assisting in money laundering during the years that Gordon worked at its subsidiary? And essentially, why doesn't Gordon disclose that he worked there? This should raise some serious questions. But I'm not Gordon, and what I seek is the truth. So let's go on. 
As you will later see, this history part is important. So Gordon worked at Axiom for almost eight years, in which he started covering Solar City and later also Tesla. As we previously saw, he was quite successful, and in 2013, he was ranked first among all analysts on tip ranks. His ranking later declined, but these results, along with his outspoken style, were enough to win him some kind of celebrity status. There were blog posts written on him, his opinions were frequently discussed, and he appeared several times on mainstream media financial shows. After Axiom, he joined Vertical Group, where he was the general manager for 20 months, before being allegedly fired for releasing a factually incorrect statement about Tesla. He then formed his own firm, GLJ Research, where he works to date. Gordon is 40 or 41 years old. I hope you don't kill me for this one, but Gordon is smarter than we think, and is also a better analyst than we think he is. If you're shocked, I will explain. I haven't gone from mocking Gordon to following him, and I still think he sucks as an analyst, but my research proves he's not nearly as bad as the ratings lead us to think. For starters, let's look at his history. Jokes aside, the guy graduated summa cum laude at Morehouse, landed jobs at top-rated companies, was top 10% in J.P. Morgan's training class, won the Proprietary Research Award at Bear Stearns, and was a VP in Lehman Brothers and a managing director at Axiom and Vertical. This definitely isn't the best analyst CV I've seen, but it's also not what I'd expect from a total moron like many of us believe that he is. You might say that since the background was lifted from Gordon's LinkedIn accounts, maybe it's misleading. Fine. But being ranked first place on tip ranks in 2013 with a whopping 83% success rate is objective, and this too is not what we'd expect of the class clown. You might say he was extremely lucky. Could be. So let's check. I couldn't find Gordon's tip ranks through the years, but using the Wayback Machine, we can see that two years later he was number 20 of almost 1,900 analysts on Investor Wand, a similar analyst rating site. I think it's fair to say that whoever's first of over 2,300 analysts in 2013 and 20th of almost 1,900 analysts in 2015 is not a moron. So what gives? One thing is this tweet by James Stevenson showing analysts' price target for Tesla versus their tip ranks star rating. It's clear to see that the good analysts have high price targets, while the bad analysts are bearish on Tesla. Don't you agree? Well, I don't. In fact, it's the other way around. Tesla's rise in 2020 was so extreme that those who were bearish on Tesla got hit hard, no matter how good all their other ratings were, while those bullish got boosted up, even if they were wrong on most other stocks. Check out this chart of Tesla stock versus the NASDAQ in the last 12 months. Even with the current dip, Tesla went up six times what NASDAQ did. And before this dip, it was nine times the NASDAQ. So let's check Gordon's ratings and see where he would rank had he not rated Tesla at all. The ranking is performed over one year only, and I have no idea how many of his ratings were last year. So let's use his overall rating numbers as a rough estimate. 18 of 258 ratings were for Tesla. So if we take Tesla's gain of 340%, multiply it by 18, and divide by 258, we get almost 24% lost just because he was bearish on Tesla. Adding this to his average return gives us 17.4%. In other words, had Gordon not rated Tesla at all, his average return would have been better than Craig Irwin's at number 872 with only 12% and would have placed him at around number 800 of over 7,000 tip ranks analysts. Definitely not the moron we think he is. In other words, Tesla aside, Gordon is a pretty good analyst. So why is he so bearish on Tesla? There are two possible reasons. One, he has ulterior motives and acts more bearishly than he really is. Or two, he really believes what he says. Let's address ulterior motives first. Many of us believe that Gordon has ulterior motives. I've heard all kinds of allegations about him. Many says he's an oil shill. Others say he's working with short sellers to bring the stock down, or maybe he's short Tesla himself. Recently, there's a weird allegation that he hates Tesla because he loves GM and his father was a GM executive. That's really not what I'd call a conflict of interest. I previously suggested that he just wants the publicity because frequent appearances on mainstream TV are worth a lot, and that he plays the bear because otherwise he wouldn't get invited. Being absurdly bearish on Tesla seems like the worst publicity an analyst could get, but there are millions who don't believe in Tesla, and for them, Gordon is the only one who gets it. I haven't seen a shred of proof supporting these allegations, but we return to them again and again because of one main reason. We find it hard to believe that someone could be so dumb or blind to the facts to actually think Tesla is going down to 
When analysts are bullish on Tesla, we cheer. And when they're bearish and give a price target of $500, because Tesla is just a car company, we nod our heads and mutter that they just don't get it. But with Gordon, it's different because he's clearly doing his best to always rain on Tesla's parade, even in record quarters. And besides, dude, $67? Really? Do you really expect us to believe you're serious? But the bottom line is that we don't have any proof, and the only reason we're looking for ulterior motives is that as Tesla bulls, we can't believe someone would seriously price Tesla the way he does. I can't rule out ulterior motives the same way that I can't rule out ulterior motives for any Tesla analyst, bull or bear. The thing is, I definitely believe that Gordon really believes what he says. Stick with me and I'll show you. The evidence is pretty convincing. Some time ago, Tesla stock had a wonderful day, but then fell dramatically on the last hour of trade. I tweeted to explain that day traders set up for that day and then sold before closing, which then triggered automatic stop losses to sell more, which started an avalanche. The explanation was solid. I even got responses telling me that this was the only explanation they saw that made sense. Nice. But then someone replied that most tech stocks had the same pattern that day because of something that happened in the news. I smacked my forehead. We love Tesla and follow it, so it's too easy to focus on Tesla and forget about the macro. And I'm telling you this because this is what we're doing in Gordon's case. You know this scene from the movie Invincible? You know I hate you? Yeah. I'm a sinner. I hate everybody. You know I hate you? Yeah. I'm a sinner. I hate everybody. The first guy thinks the other guy hates him. And sure, he does. But nothing personal. He hates everybody. Same with Gordon. It's not about Tesla, dummy. It's about everything. What do you see in this picture? That's right, a bear. And here? Same bear again. And now? If I told you this is the same bear, you'd think I'm crazy. So why do we expect Gordon to stop being a bear with Tesla? You see, Gordon is a true bear. You're, you're a bear. You're, you're bear. bearish on the, pretty much the entire industry. Let's check his 2013 ratings when he won first place on tip ranks. We only see a glimpse, but it's sell, 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 and sell. All sells. And here's what tip ranks wrote about him in a blog piece when he won first place in 2013. Gordon focuses on companies involved with solar power. He knows when to capitalize on the company by selling the stock at the right time. Okay, so 2013 was good for bears, and this won him first place. But maybe he was bearish just because he realized it was a down year. So let's check later. Here are his 2015 ratings on Investor Wand. We have sell, 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 one buy, and all the rest sells. So 20 ratings. 19 of them are mostly profitable sells, and the only buy he gave lost him 85%. So better not to make that mistake again, right? But that was then. So let's check now. Of 258 ratings Gordon has on tip ranks, almost three quarters were sells, 13% were holds, and only 14% were buys. So Gordon is consistent throughout the years. Sure, he's all doom and gloom about Tesla, but he's doom and gloom everywhere. In fact, Here's a candid video of him from when he was a child. Oh, help! The sky is falling! Oh, help! The sky is falling! Tesla is a story company. It has lots of opportunities, but so many risks, too. You have to be optimistic to believe in Tesla, which Gordon clearly isn't. How can we even think he would give it anything more than an automobile company's multiple on its currently small earnings, at the very most? How can we think he will underrate the impact of the ZEV credit cash cow eventually disappearing? Conspiracy theorists might point out that since he mostly covers solar and renewable energy and puts a sell on everything, maybe he is an oil shill after all. Could be, but he's been this way for ages, even when he was an unknown nobody working for Hapoelim Securities, and he's been putting sells on companies in all sectors. So sure, he almost only puts sells on Tesla and solar, but he does the same on everything else too with companies such as United Rentals, Cleveland Cliffs, an iron ore mining company, and Rio Tinto, a 150-year-old mineral mining company completely unrelated to renewable energy. The guy also puts cells on Joy Global, a coal mining equipment manufacturer. So really, the case for him being a shell for the fossil fuels industry seems pretty wobbly to me. But wait, there's more. Consider this. When Tesla lowers prices, we say they cut costs and are passing them to consumers. And when Tesla raises them, we say they have too much demand. But Gordon says the exact opposite. Why? And we usually believe Elon and don't doubt his intentions, but Gordon doesn't trust a single thing that Elon says. Why? 
This goes far beyond Gordon's pessimism. It's also a matter of trust and mainly emotions. There are so many reasons to doubt Elon if you want to, and so many others to believe and trust him. One huge example is that Elon promised full self-driving long ago, and it's not here yet. I know exactly how this happened because I tend to set extremely challenging timelines in my work too, and then work my own ass off as well as others to deliver. And I know very well how unforeseen problems could sometimes throw you back into square one, costing dear time. But that's exactly what advancing the cutting edge is like. So yeah, I fully believe Elon, but if you're judging by what other stocks do and looking for short term only, it's easy to think Elon is selling hot air. I fully get why someone as pessimistic or suspicious as Gordon would distrust Elon. So Gordon is convinced that Tesla is extremely overvalued, but stays that way because Elon is an amazing con artist, which sells stories to his fanboys to inflate the stock, just like Trevor Milton did at Nikola. And Gordon shouts again and again that the Imperator has no clothes. But instead of getting the public acclaim he thinks he deserves, he becomes a victim of Tesla's wild success. His rankings get hit and he falls from number 200 to number 7,000. He is mocked and ridiculed and his intentions and integrity are questioned. This breeds hate. And this hatred blinds Gordon from seeing clearly. Just a small example. Once Gordon tweeted a low prediction for EV sales in a few years, I politely asked him if he knows Tony Siba's presentations. And that was enough to get me blocked. I mean, dude, if you shut your eyes and cover your ears to anything that doesn't fit your views, how do you expect to be less wrong? Before wrapping things up, I want to backpedal on something. Sure, Gordon sees gloom and doom everywhere, but it's not just pessimism. He actually specializes in seeing gloom and doom and is usually very successful in this. I repeat, he is good. It's not me saying this, it's his record through several years and in several sectors. With Tesla aside, he'd be number 200 out of 7,000 analysts. And that's an amazing bull year when the most successful analysts were those issuing buys. I started this video talking about disruption being a cliff that we have to learn not to fall off. And this is the case with Gordon. Gordon is an intentional bear, a sell side analyst with proven ways of analyzing companies to find which of them will fail. I think you'll agree with me that 99% of other companies would have gone belly up had they faced the hurdles Tesla had to overcome in the last few years. For any other company, Gordon would have been correct the champion of the day. The thing is, Tesla is not like other companies. It has an extremely unique leader with huge brains and equally huge determination. It also has some of the best engineers anywhere, and they're all on a mission. Add on to that, that Tesla is extremely disruptive, so regular methods just don't work for it, and Gordon failed to realize that and adapt. In a way, it's sad. Everything I said till now is just a thesis, and you might still think that Gordon is a shill. So here's something to drive this through. I never block Tesla cues and often debate with them because being long Tesla, it's important for me to hear both sides and ensure that my bullishness doesn't shut my eyes to risks. While making the finishing touches on this video, I engaged in a debate about Tesla's new factories with a Tesla Q friend of mine, Klaus Müller. I wrote these would be the world's biggest factories and that Berlin would make 2 million cars a year. And Klaus disagreed because VW's Wolfsburg plant makes 800,000 cars and Tesla's application was for only 500,000. He said I was imagining things or lying. I explained that lying about Tesla would be lying to myself and I only give numbers I believe are true. I added that current applications are partial and that plans are for 2 million. Just like until recently, Tesla didn't apply for a battery factory, but now they applied and have started building it. He persisted that he has no idea why I'm lying, but I am. This went on until I ended it. Without mutual respect, there was no use in going on. He replied that since I'm presenting lies as an alternative truth, there really is no point. I shook my head. No hope with this guy. But then it dawned on me. Remember how I previously said that we think Gordon's lying because, dude, $67? You can't be serious. Claus thought that I was lying because I can't seriously believe that Tesla plans to produce twice as many cars as Wolfsburg on that piece of land. So I returned to the conversation and asked Claus, you're Tesla Q. Do you think that Gordon really believes his $67 target, or is he exaggerating his bearishness? His answer was decisive. He thinks Gordon is very serious, and that if valued the same way as other car manufacturers, even $67 was too generous. So we find it hard to believe that Gordon can be serious with his absurd bearishness, and Tesla Qs find it hard to believe that we can be serious with our absurd bullishness. But they view Tesla through ordinary metrics, as a small car company with little profits and with larger and higher quality players soon to arrive. 
And we view Tesla through disruption as an innovative and rapidly growing tech company leading in energy, autonomy, and AI. And they're not even making cars. They're making EVs, a disruption they're leading with OEMs trailing behind. Unless you understand disruption, it's easy to dismiss small companies that claim they will rule the world. Gordon is a fine sell-side analyst as far as regular companies go, but he just cannot understand disruption. This is his main fallacy, but he's not alone. Here's how Tom Anderson reacted in 1997 to Amazon's growth. The company says it's investing for the future. Skeptics say it would have to sell every book being sold in the world today to justify its stock price. I think my generation grew up with Sears, and Amazon is worth 20% more than Sears is worth in market capitalization. How do you view that phenomenon that Amazon today is worth more than Sears? Investors are focused on the future. Amazon has growth potential that Sears doesn't. A couple of geeks who sketched out some software could destroy Sears Roebuck. That's the beauty of technology and the microprocessor. We've never seen anything like it. And there are lots of lessons to learn here. One is that we need to understand disruptions if we want to ride their wave, not drown in it. Another is we need to check things by first principles, not by comparing Tesla to the likes of GM and thus saying it's overvalued. And we shouldn't put too much importance over one-year analyst ratings, such as Tip Ranks provides. A few years ago, Gordon had outstanding returns. Now, he seems like junk. Similarly, ARK Invest was amazing for years, but judging them by 2021, like Jim Cramer recently did, they are lagging. Always look long-term. Similarly, the warning label of past performance is not indicative of the future is definitely true. Don't trust Kathy Wood or 2013 Gordon Johnson. Do your own research. Don't let emotions cloud your judgment. Emotions are an investor's worst enemies. You know this quote by Jim Cramer? Beware of it, because just like hate blinds Gordon to Tesla's virtues, our love to Tesla might blind us to weaknesses. Similarly, always listen to other opinions. I often discuss Tesla with well-meaning Tesla bears, because shutting myself to opinions might make me miss a vital point. Living in an echo chamber is extremely dangerous. Check the macro, not just the micro. Take a wider view than just Tesla. When Tesla is rising or crashing, it could be related to Tesla, but maybe it's the entire market. Similarly, when Gordon is bearish on Tesla, it could be that he's bearish everywhere. When someone thinks completely different from you and you consider their ideas and conclude they are dead wrong, don't just assume that they're dumb or think they are shills. There could be other reasons too. And finally, this is Gordon. Don't be a Gordon. I'll finish off with an Elon Musk interview, but first, what do you think? Am I right or am I wrong? Is Gordon Johnson just dumb? Is he a shill? Is he unable to grasp disruption? Or is it all the above? Whether you agree or disagree with me, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I read all your comments. If you found this video interesting, please smash the like and subscribe buttons to help me start growing the channel and get notified on upcoming videos. Feel free to contact me and follow me on Twitter where I am connecting ODOTS. Special thanks to Ashley E and Cyber Wrangler of Data for helping me out with the Jim Kramer quote. I really appreciate your being here. It means a lot. Till next time, I am connecting the dots and you are amazing. I think people should be nicer to each other and give people and give give more credit to, to others and don't assume that they're mean until you know they're actually mean. You know, just it's easy to demonize people. You're usually wrong about it. People are nicer than you think. Give people more credit.